Good morning, and welcome to uh, today's Cichlids and Coffee live stream. I hope you're doing well wherever you are. And um, happy birthday to, is it Elizabeth? Elizabeth Wagner. Happy birthday, Elizabeth. And um, here's wishing you, wishing you many, many more. So um, welcome all of you, all of you early birds, everyone who's here. And um, let's take a look here. Looks like, uh, hey, Eamon, you were the first one here promoting the money-back guarantee. <laughs> There's a joke about uh, anyone who doesn't like uh, the content gets a full refund. <laughs> Thank you, Eamon, for, uh, for that. <laughs> James Green, hello, James Green. Happy Saturday to you. And Richard Lewis, hello, Richard. And uh, Multifasciatus, will there be more? Talk than nit uh, what more? Talk than nitrate in water? Yes, uh, perhaps. And uh, let's see here. Hey, Ricky De Hoyos comes in with a super chat for dollar ninety nine. Thank you, Ricky. Thanks for getting that going. I appreciate you, super chatters, for helping me out. And uh, hello, Alex. Good morning to you up in beautiful Canada. Amber, hello, Amber. Frank is here. Buenos dias, amigo. ¿Cómo te encuentras? Bien. <laughs> you know, I don't speak much Spanish anymore since my uh, parents passed away, but uh, still enjoy doing it. Uh, John, hello, John. Hello, Denny. Good to see you. Nate. All right. Our Baglio's here. All righty. Cat Sailor. Hello, Cat Sailor. And I can't get to all of you because I'll just keep saying names all day. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and get to it here. I've got a bit to talk about today. And, um, by the way, who who can remember who can remember why I came to um, I came to Nashville in the first place? Who can who can remember why I came to Nashville? What was one of the main reasons that I relocated from uh, my beautiful Southern California to Middle Tennessee to Nashville? Uh, let, let's see if anyone if anyone can remember. What was one of the main reasons? Those of you who follow the channel, you'll know. And uh, I'm checking the chat here. By the way, how's the sound? How's sound and picture? Are sound and picture good? Audio and video? Everything looks good? Give me, give me a, a sign in the chat. Solar King Ronnie? You're, 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 you're real, real close. Kathy and, and Naomi, you're real close as well. <laughs> Country Western singing sensation. <laughs> oh, well, you're all, you're, you're all, there you go. Cat Sailor. Cat Sailor got it. Um, uh, thank you, Elijah. And old fish guy, and uh, for your, your comments, but um, yes, um, cat sailor got it. My daughter has started contractions. Can you believe it? It's happening. It's happening. My uh, first granddaughter should be here very shortly. So if the uh, live stream has to end abruptly, I'll <laughs> you'll know why. But um, the first time I mentioned it, it was just sort of a dream that I that we'd have our first grandchild. And um, anyway, this close. And uh, anyway, wish us, you know, wish her luck, wish her luck. And uh, I'm looking forward to meeting our our new addition to the family. So um, sound and picture, great. Okay, very very good. Thank you for that. So that is happening as we speak. The contractions are too far apart right now to rush to the hospital, but. They're happening, and uh, it's true that sometimes a birth can involve several false starts. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that, I mean, she's ready. She's ready. Anyone who's known anyone who's been pregnant knows that they get to a point where it's like, okay, that's enough. It's too much. It's hard to sit down. It's hard to move. I can't see my feet. That's it. I've got <laughs> to get on with it. So she's at that point now. She, she wants to go ahead and, and have the baby. 
And a lot of your other guesses, Denny, yes, cost of living, uh, you know, air quality, places to ride my bike. Uh, there were a lot of reasons. There were a lot of reasons. But primarily, primarily to be close to uh, my oldest daughter and son-in-law. Uh, and uh, because that we felt that that was going to be the, uh, the closest, closest chance to uh, having a grandchild. And it came to fruition faster, faster than I thought, actually. So um, <clears throat> thank you, Richard. Thank you for the congratulations. I appreciate that. You know, just uh, thoughts and prayers. You know, things can, can go sideways sometimes. Uh, she's been very, very healthy throughout the entire process. So we're hoping it's going to be very, very smooth. So um, let's see what's been going on here. And um, it looks like we have several folks on. And so well, let's go ahead and do the official start. What do you say? Now don't forget, if you're new to the channel, be sure to hit that sub button. We are this close, this close to 40,000, and um, that's going to be a cause for celebration. I had no, no, no idea this channel could grow that much. Also, for those of you who would uh, like to support the channel, please consider visiting Amazon using my link, whether you buy anything from my store or from anywhere on Amazon. After using the Amazon link, you will provide a small percentage or credit to, to the channel. Doesn't increase your cost at all. Also, you can pick up things like, uh, you know, some swag, some merchandise at the Teespring store. Be sure to use live stream for a 10% discount at the Teespring store. Uh, and also a big shout out to um, my moderators, wonderful moderators, the best on YouTube, and also to the channel sponsor, the Cichlid Shack in Tempe, Arizona, 10% off on food and goods and, and products. Uh, no limit. You can, it's for $20 or, or you know, or more or, or any amount, really. You can get 10% off using Shack Attack 10. If you go over $100 in fish, uh, your fish order can get a 15% discount with Shack Attack 15. And the last thing I'll say is consider joining the garage gang the garage gang is patreon and uh there is new a new patreon uh, that i've started and it's going to be offering uh, for certain levels you can get t-shirts and uh hoodies and stuff like that and um at any rate i decided to finally start a patreon channel so visit that if you like you can click on it and and uh right under the banner of the YouTube channel, you can click on the Patreon icon and um, it'll direct you on how to get there. There are a few patrons already and I thank you folks for joining uh, Patreon. And uh, let me go ahead and close all that. I thank you folks for joining Patreon. It, it's really helpful. Some of you uh, patrons are on here right now. I appreciate you. You're uh, you're jumping into that so early, and certain levels of a membership will get you uh, some swag. We'll get you a, a mug, uh, a tea, a hoodie, things like that. So if you go to the Patreon, you can you can read all the details there. So um, that's enough for paying the bills. Let's go ahead and close all that. All right. So today's topic, let's get into today's topic. You know, um, you folks are kind enough to help me out. Every now and then I'll, I'll, I'll release a video. And um, under the comments of the video, one of you will say, well, how about blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I'll hit myself in my forehead. I just go, what? Why didn't I? Why didn't I say that? I mean, that's that. Now that you've said it, it's so important. And and uh, and I had even thought about it very often before, before um, recording the video. And for some reason, uh, which is why it always helps me to write things down. You know, I always, you know, I have things written here. I've got a. a you notice back here, there's a project board behind me. There's a project board that reminds me to, you know. Pants first, then shoes, 
you know, basic reminders uh, for life. <laughs> and so I have certain, I, I, I need my memory jogged every now and then. And so sometimes some of you will say something and I'll go, oh, I missed it. And I'll tell the commenter, very good, very good point. Thank you so much for that. But there's no way to really kind of get back to the video and, and without doing a complete delete and, and, and re-upload, which is, you know, just a tremendous task. So, um, so I wrote down a few things that, I, that stood out at me that, that people mentioned. And uh, thank you, John Wallace, for promoting Thumbs Up. <laughs> I've got my team working for me here, you know. Hey, John, you should consider being a, a moderator, actually. At some point, we should make you a moderator. Um, <clears throat> two of my moderators, I think GP, I think uh, GP has uh, a wedding to go to, like uh, an, an, an Indian wedding. For any of you that know what an Indian wedding is, it's like three or four days of wild celebration. So we're not going to be, I don't think we're going to be seeing him unless he can sneak out for a minute. And, um, and then Jerry, Jerry had to go handle, um, uh, Jerry Martin had to handle something personal. So I don't think he's going to be here either, but so at any rate, um, I, I released some water change videos. You remember those? Um, and, um, you know, water changes. Water changes are are a real big, you know, like a popular subject. And I and I've released several videos about water changes and and how I've done them or changed doing them over the years. And of course, my last one had a lot to do with um, should you do them so frequently? Should you do them so often? Are they really that needed that often? Is it just habit? Is it just superstition? Is it uh, do we really need them? And I talked about um, uh, testing before you do them. And, and also being very, um, for lack of a better word, and I guess pun intended, be very, very fluid, be very fluid in your approach to water changes. And by that, what I mean is realize that your circumstances are evolving, how much you feed, the size of your fish, the, the, the amount of fish that you're keeping, all these things are, are in flux, how much, how much filtration you have, the condition of your filtration, that's changing all the time, right? If it's doing its job, it's becoming dirtier and dirtier, more and more blocked water circulation turn, water, and water turnover is decreasing over time if your filters are doing what they're supposed to be doing. So all these are factors that can impact whether you should do a water change or not. And so uh, I thought I had covered, I thought I'd covered a lot of the bases. And then after I realized that there was a very important tip that I left out. That, that tip was, um, that, that, that tip was be sure to test your tap. Always te test your tap water. Because if you don't test your tap water, you, you might be driving yourself crazy uh, and, and, and not be able to figure out why things are not improving. I'll give you an example. A while back, I released a video, and I did the math on it. I'm not going to do the math on it right now, but but it had to do with if you had 10 parts per million or 20 parts per million of nitrate, which over the years I've heard people tell me that they've, they've had high levels of nitrate out of their tap. They've had to go out and get uh, filtered water from stores and, and just go through all kinds of crazy things to reduce nitrates. But if you measure, uh, let's say for the sake of simplicity, uh, 10 parts per million coming out of your tap, and, and you do less than a 50% water change, and you're adding 10 parts per million water, you're probably not going to make a real big dent in the level of, nit you're gonna, in the level of nitrates. If you're sitting at about 40, let's say, at the beginning of the water change. Uh, you're gonna you're, you're 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 just you're adding nitrate as you add the new water, and granted you're diluting it a little bit, but you're gonna have to go with much larger, larger water changes. And I think what I came up with was ten percent greater, ten percent greater water change than fifty percent for every ten parts per million coming out of your coming out of your tap. There's some kind of an equation like that. So 50% being the starting point, if you have nitrates, never do less than 50%. But for every 10 parts per million, 
do another another 10 percent so in a 100 gallon aquarium right you would you would you would remove 50 percent that's 50 gallons then another another 10 percent right another five gallons so you would remove 55 gallons of water minimum probably 60 more ideally and um and then you would start to see a drop in your nitrates and um so at any rate i'm not trying to get over complicated here all i'm saying is is um check your tap check your tap sometimes you'll see ammonia coming out of the tap now if you have ammonia coming out of your tap and apparently some cities add ammonia uh, as a disinfectant to the water i think i don't think that's good for us <laughs> And it's probably in a very small amount, but I, I, it's certainly not good for your fish. Now, the um, I know Safe, Seachem Safe, has um, a different formula, a different amount that you add to the tank if you have an ammonia issue. And so I would add more than I normally add if I had ammonia coming out of my tap. I'm not going to know that if I don't test the tap, so I have to test the tap. Right now, I use less than a quarter teaspoon because a quarter teaspoon of safe will condition 300 gallons of water. So I use two thirds of a quarter teaspoon of safe in a cup of water to condition this entire setup here. And uh, so this is why a small container of Seacam safe w will, will last you, you know, months and months and months. However, if you have, I believe if you have a, an ammonia issue, that amount kicks up to, I believe, about maybe a quarter teaspoon for maybe a teaspoon. I mean, I mean I'll have to look at the thing, but it, it kicks up considerably if you have an ammonia issue. So uh, just something to keep in mind. And uh, so that was one point. One point was... Uh, was checking your checking your your tap because it can actually impact the the way that you both how much you change what percentage of water you change and also will impact uh, how you treat if you're using a product like Safe it'll it'll impact how you're treating your tank water when you're adding the water to the tank. I go tap to tank. I don't pick up buckets anymore. Occasionally, occasionally I have no choice but to. For example, with my wife's aquarium that, that I'm, I still haven't set up, but I'm going to set up in her office, uh, that's going to have to be, I think I'm probably going to have to use buckets because I don't think I can, I might be able to connect up to the bathroom faucets that are around the corner on the second floor, but we'll see. We'll see how that works. Now, a while back, I talked about a way of adding fish to a tank commonly referred to as uh, flop and drop, uh, where fish that have traveled for a long distance if you do a trickle acclimation or you or you do you know you you open the bag and add oxygen to the mix it can actually create a chemical reaction in the water and be very harmful to your fish so your best your best bet is to float the bag for 15 20 minutes and then pull the bag out of the tank and then pour it out into a bucket through a net so that you catch the fish in the net and then drop him in the tank called a flop and drop. I've never had a problem with doing it that way and it really minimizes the, um, the stress on the fish, believe it or not. And um, yeah, should I be fish nitrate creep? That's what I was <laughs> calling it. The, uh, so flop and drop, one thing I, I forgot to mention, this applies to any time. If you ever have a fish get away from you on a flop and drop, and I have, I have had that happen. And uh, be sure to dip your hand in the aquarium or in under the sink very quickly. Wet your hand before you pick up the fish. Now, this is going to add maybe a couple seconds, uh, maybe 10 or 15 seconds to picking up that fish. But apparently, if your hands are dry when you pick up a fish, you strip the fish of its slime coat. Now, the fish is already under stress, and that stress is already making it sus susceptible to more susceptible and, and more likely to contract any, you know, bacteria or virus that you might have in there or, you know, 
anything like that, any parasites that are maybe dormant in its gut are now going to be able to, are going to come to the surface. So the fish is already under stress. So you don't want to strip, strip the slime coat. So wet your hands and, and, and pick that, pick that puppy up at, with wet hands very gently and, and drop them, drop them in the aquarium. And so just something I forgot, I forgot to, to, uh, mentioned before and um, also in my water change video I, I, I mentioned uh, you know I stressed that there are times that you really shouldn't do water changes depending on your test results I really want to emphasize that you don't want to wait until circumstances are bad and then do a water change. In other words, yeah, 10 parts per million on nitrate, some zero ammonia, zero nitrite. I'm not going to do a water change here, but you know what? When, it, when it's at 25, 30, I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to wait for 40, 80, and 100. So still stay ahead of it. In other words, don't wait for some some disaster or some something drastic and then go oh okay time to water change still try and anticipate and 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 stay ahead of it and also there are circumstances when you would do a water change regardless of your readings i'll give you an example in this tank right now my um the the fish that's called a phoenix this is that purple orange fish that is unique to the cichlid shack. They you can that's where you get them from. See them right there with that orange blaze. Blue lips. Purple on the sides, orange fringe on the uh, dorsal tail and anal fin. Beautiful fish. Absolutely beautiful. He has right now, he has a little bit, a teeny bit of a foggy eye. The foggy eye is at the very top of his right eye. It's not covering the whole eye. It's not like some of the horrible foggy. I've, I've had fish with horrible foggy eyes where it's turned into almost like a fungus and it's just been horrible where they've lost the eye. I had a gar that lost an eye and would only circle in the direction of its good of its eye. It would only, it would only make left turns, would never make a right turn. But it was a funny fish. I ended up giving it to Nolan down at Nolan's Aquarium in Santa Ana, California. But at any rate, we called him Lefty. So the the uh, when you have fo a foggy eye, a fish with foggy eye, really the best the best solution, assuming it's not covered in in in, in a bac bacterial or, or you know fungus type of situation, best solution is good clean water. So I'm doing, uh, you know, good size water changes here, just just to help clear up the foggy eye on on that on that phoenix fish. So there are exceptions to the rule that even if you have great uh, great test readings, you still do a water change. You also have circumstances where, for example, uh, when you're medicating a tank, the instructions might say medicate. Uh, which I think might be the case with 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 Marison and Fritz, uh, Fritz Marison, maybe even Paracleanse. You don't do any water changes while medicating. You 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 don't do any water changes. But then at the end of the treatment cycle, it's recommended that you do a water change. So it's gone it's gone four or five days. You've gone through the treatment cycle. Your readings are ten parts per million. You still do a water change. Because that's what your, that's what the medication actually indicates, and I think the one of the main problems that people have with medications is they don't follow the directions exactly the way exactly to the letter. They'll modify it, or they'll they'll forget to take the carbon out of the filter, or um, they'll do a water change in the middle of the treatment. I mean, they'll they'll not follow, and then they don't get the results, and they go, "Oh, this medication doesn't work. It's trash." And uh, no, you, you need to you, you need to follow it exactly. And in the case of, of Marison, I think after the fifth day, you do a water change. And if the condition hasn't improved, you repeat the treatment. 
I have two geos right now that are their their tails were looking frayed, and uh, so I'm 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 putting them through uh, a little bit of treatment in a in a separated twenty nine. I think they just nipped each other to death. Surimanensis, Geophagus surimanensis. I have three of them, and one of them has been returned to the 90. He's looking good. His tail uh, recovered very quickly. But I have a, uh, another one that is uh, uh, pretty pretty ripped up. And and once once that tail starts to go, it, it almost starts to, uh, it can actually get a little bit of fin rot. And that fin rot can go all the way into the meat of the body, and, that, and that, then you've got a real serious problem. So I have two fish right now that are in a separated 29-gallon going through a, uh, a, a fin rot medication. And uh, so there are exceptions on my water change video that I should have included. Uh, certainly check the tap and certainly follow the instructions of medicating uh, regardless of what your uh, – regardless – of what your uh, test results are. Now, I've talked a lot about heaters. Uh, recently, I talked about winterizing and uh, preparing your tanks for winter. The um, I'll take long sips of my coffee, and that way when the video posts to YouTube, that's where I can insert the commercial. The mastermind, the wheels are always turning. So, so, hey, Denny, thank you for that super chat. John Wallace, thank you for your super chat. Desert Fish, thank you for the super chat. Very nice of you. So I talked about heaters, and um, one thing that's important about heaters that uh, I, I've got to stress is that, let's get this over here. Did I miss another super chat? I hope not. Let me see. I'm going through here. I got Ricky the Hoyas. And okay. So one thing about about uh, about heaters is you have to you need to acclimate them. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. And you probably know this already. And, uh, you know, maybe I'm preaching to the choir here, and, and for those of you who have been around the block a little bit, but when you put a heater in an aquarium, let that heater sit there for about 15 to as much as 30 minutes. Just let it sit there in the aquarium and then plug it in. Same thing when you uh, are going to pull the heater out. Don't unplug and pull out. Unplug, let it sit there 15, 20, 30 minutes, and then pull it out. That way you risk actually uh, possibly cracking the heater because of its reaction to the, to the sudden or abrupt temperature change. Now, some of the heaters these days, like these Eheim heaters that are sitting in these 55-gallon tanks behind me, that glass is really super thick. But it, that's not the case with, with every heater. I know uh, some heaters are are uh, now made with glass that you could that you could the kind of glass that you cook with, right? And uh, so the the quality of the glass in heaters is getting better and better. And certainly, if you pay more, you're probably going to get a better heater uh, that has le a less likelihood to crack. Some heaters, some heaters actually have an auto shut off. You're very high quality, like I think your Oase now has heaters that will, will shut off if they detect a, a, a sudden or abrupt change in the external, like, like you can tell it was remo removed out of the environment. Again, you're going to pay a little more, but you're going to save the heater. So acclimate your heaters. Let them sit in the tank for 15 minutes before you plug them in. Let, the, let them sit unplugged for 15 minutes. Now, here's a tip. A fully submersible heater can be used horizontally, if you don't mind the way it looks. Now, I have these giant Eheims. I don't know if you can even see them. Let me move the camera here. Hey, Cat Sailor, thanks for that super chat. See that big magic wand in the bottom of that aquarium? The home of my uh, dragon blood? That dragon blood is coming over to the 210 as soon as I get uh, some additional fish that are coming from the cichlid shack. They would have been here already, but James has been very, very busy. And so I'm not going to 
I can go ahead and tell them, go ahead and send them when you can. But at any rate, the um, that's a that's a big Eheim, big Eheim three hundred, and um, no way on earth it can stand up in a fifty five. It would stick out about a third. So I'm either gonna have to find some small three hundreds, and they're out there, or um, or I'll just use it horizontally. But at any rate, my tip is this. A fully submersible heater, you can run horizontal. And if you run it horizontal and have it near the bottom of your aquarium, you don't have to worry about blowing out your heater during a water change. I've heard stories about people who have their heaters blow up on them. They have their heaters blow up because when they did the water change, they forgot to unplug it. And then what happened is the, the heater got too exposed and then it cracked. And then it releases all kinds of junk into your tank. And of course, you have to replace the heater. So it, 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 it turns what should have been a, a 45 minute to an hour and a half chore into probably a half day of cleaning out the gunk and the glass running off to the pet store and buying a replacement and et cetera, et cetera. You get the, so definitely put them, put them sideways. And, uh, Hey, Mary page. Good to see you. So that's my tip on that. And I also talked a little bit in that winterizing, uh, in that winterizing, preparing your tanks for winter video. One thing that I that I that I should have mentioned also is that winter winter is the time when we're the most susceptible to power outages. And I know in California, very different set of circumstances there. Uh, if you got Santa Ana winds, right in the middle of you know, the middle of summer, you get a windstorm, and all of a sudden you get a power outage. And of course, we had rolling brownouts in California. Which is how they, uh, which is how they would then raise the rates because they would they would they would sort of cut off your energy and then they would send you a letter a couple of weeks later saying we need to raise the rates <laughs> or we'll cut your energy off again. <laughs> Called brown, rolling brownouts, they call them. So, the um, so at any rate, it, I would suggest if you're going to have a power backup. Let's say you have a, uh, like these days, they have some pretty nice compact power backup. So without having to get an entire gasoline powered generator or a, maybe a, a solar powered backup to your whole house or something like that, you can just get a, uh, a, a compact power backup that can run for a, a good number of hours. And I would have your, your heater and uh, uh, plugged into it because it, it, in the winter, if you, because the temperature can drop very sharply without any heat. Uh, available uh, through through your ducking or through your space heaters. I mean, all of a sudden the tank is just in an outside temperature. And so have your heater plugged into, uh, or your controller, depending how you run your heaters, have it plugged into a, the backup. And also have a uh, battery powered, battery powered air pump. Believe it or not, during, during power outages, the thing that's gonna kill your fish I mean, a gradual temperature, temperature change, they can probably tolerate a much broader range of temperature than you imagine. Some fish are going to be more sensitive than others. But they'll be able to tolerate a, 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 a gradual change in temperature, especially in a very large tank like this where temperature is going to change very slowly. A small tank, a little 5-gallon, a little 10-gallon, it's going to change very quickly. So you should have a little power back up there for your battery. What's going to kill them, though, in the event of a power outage, is a lack of oxygen. Because all of a sudden you have no, no water movement, no surface tension breakup, and they're just going to be sitting in their own waste, in their own gases. And so either you're going to come into that, you're going to come into that fish room and you're going to stir that tank up with your fingers. You're going to run your fingers through the surface for about, you know, a minute in each of your tanks. Or you have something like um like a cobalt rescue air 
that that detects when the power cuts out and then starts starts up and uh, so that's something that i that i that i encourage you to get have some battery powered i have a, a couple of them i'm going to be getting some more uh, actually um Higer is coming out with a new line of lithium lithium battery powered uh air pumps and so have some of those because it's the O2. Now, if you can have one like the cobalt that detects a power outage and then kicks on, that's ideal. Because let's say you're you're gone for the day and where you live is five degrees. And you're, you know, you're three, four hours away. Uh, you know, you're, you're going to have some problems. You're probably going to have some problems. But... Um, but at least, you, at least the fish are not going to get killed off by a lack of O2, which is terrible. You know, they basically get choked to death. So, um, somebody mentioned, I saw, let me see this here. I, I saw a uh, super chat with a question. Let me see and pull that up here. And Cat Sailor, I said thanks for your super chat. Yeah, I did. Okay. Michael. Hey, Michael. Glad you're here. And Michael asks, how much surface agitation is necessary for a more stock tank? Also, do you ever give meds to your fish as a prophylactic? Um, no. On the second question, I don't. And I know there's different camps, right? One of the most respected fish keepers uh, out there, I think, uh, Corey from the Aquarium Co-op. I know he runs his fish through a whole regimen, uh, but keep in mind, he gets his fish from the Far East and all over the place, so they come with all kinds of crazy stuff. But um, I keep my fish in quarantine for a month, and if during that month I see good color activity, no sunken belly, uh, poops that look normal, they're eating, they're interacting with me, uh, after a month, I put them in the main tank. I don't, I don't. I don't medicate um, unless I see something. I'm of the belief that we over medicate. I think we do that with with. I think we do it with humans. I think we have super bacteria now uh, because we've overused antibiotics with humans, and so the bacteria has continued to evolve. And now there's some stuff that doesn't even respond to antibiotic, which is very very scary. So uh, no. Now surface agitation. I. And, you know, it's amazing how many things we do because of experiences that we've had that were negative. <laughs> how many things we're still trying to stop from happening that have already happened? <laughs> I had a very bad experience with O2. I lost some fish. And so I have a power head right on the far end creating a lot of circulation. I have uh, one of the outputs of the FX6 pointed upward. So this tank has, if you look at it from above, it, it, it looks like uh, like some rapids. You know, it looks like some rapids in a, in a river. You could <laughs> put a little raft on there. You could run the rapids. So I like a lot of surface agitation, a lot of surface tension breakup. I also, over the years, have changed my mind about bubblers. I used to not like the way bubblers look. I don't like bubbles in the tank. Uh, I thought it was very, I don't know. I, I, I just didn't like the way it looked. I've changed my mind. I, 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 I kind of like the way they look now. If you look at the 90, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you here. Hold on. You can see there in the 90 gallon, you can see that there's a, um, a massive, a massive bubble disc that's nestled inside of that, um, of that wood, that Mopani driftwood I have there. So it's just a big disc with a, uh, a two prong fluval air pump that has a little gang valve that turns the two prongs into one. So it's pushing a lot of air into that thing. Now that tank has a, um, a plexi, a plexi cover 
because if some of you remember, I had one of my viejas jumped out on me. And um, so to prevent jumping, I have the tank very sealed up. There's a plexi cover that goes all the way to the back where the um, where the marine land overflows are at, or the, the marine land hang on back filters. So because I have it so sealed up, I decided to go ahead and add that monster, that monster air. Now, I don't mind that. I think it's kind of pretty. The fish sometimes will swim through it. You can see a couple of the uh, AC heck lies there coming into the camera. There's the uh, a red shoulder, Severum, you can see there in the background. There's the Vieja. And there's a Geo in there, and there's a, a little Jack Dempsey that's not in the camera right now. So I think uh, I think if you have a bubbler in there and you have, let's say, a um, if you have a bubbler and a wave maker that's pointed slightly up, I think you're gonna be fine. I think you're gonna have plenty, you're gonna have plenty, plenty of surface agitation. So all right. Now I'm gonna be coming out with a video. And it's going to have to do with the topic, the topic of being a bit frugal. <laughs> Actually, a kind of a cheapskate. I'm kind of a cheapskate. <laughs> and what I mean by a cheapskate is this. If I, can, if I can create circumstances for my fish that are excellent, and at the same time not waste or spend a lot of money, I'm going to do that. That's why you've probably noticed over the years that I've, I've started to move more in the direction of sponges as, a, uh, as, as the primary media in my filters, as both the home of beneficial bacteria and also the media. And also I've, I've, I've moved in the direction of a, of, a deep, of a deep substrate as the home of beneficial bacteria for the purposes of one, just being more stable because I don't mess with it that often. And also, uh, it's a lot less expensive than some of the more expensive brands of, of you know, product out there for, for beneficial bacteria that, you know, whether you're talking uh, Matrix or uh, Marine Pure or Biohome, all good products. I've had success with all of them. But if I can get, if I can get a, a good outcome, a good outcome without spending a tremendous amount of money, why not? Why not do that? And so um, I'm probably going to come out with a video on how how to be frugal, how to inexpensively get very good results with your fish. I mean, this tank here, I mean, I homemade, I DIY'd the sump, uh, where a sump can cost you $300. Uh, you know, it cost me a little bit of labor and pr probably under $100. And, uh, and recently... Give me an example of just how frugal I am. This is a this is a product from Marineland, and what this is it, it's the cage that you can put media in. And what I do is I buy these I buy these cages, I buy these 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 uh, these holders these cartridges, and and then I'll use something like pinky, pinky floss, or uh, this is a product from the aquarium co-op. They have regular, they have regular floss and they have also this product. This is a carbon, a carbon infused product. So I'm getting essentially the same, if I have two cartridges, Two of these cartridges that I bought, and the one, one of them has pinky floss in it, and the other one has some of this material from, from the co-op, then basically I, I have the same sort of combination of things that Marineland would provide me if I bought their cartridges. So 
the advantage of the white filters that are sold by the co-op or putting a medium sponge inside one of those cartridges is that you simply rinse it out and reuse it and reuse it and reuse it. So the days of buying the cartridges, those days are over. So I have some of this carbon material. I'll probably use some of that. But then what I'll probably end up doing is just cutting, cutting some sponge material and using that. And so the cartridges are a one-time purchase, and then that's it. You can also buy sponges that are pretty rigid, like the um, like they sell some very rigid sponges at Bulk Reef Supply. And I believe the sponges that you can get from Swiss Tropicals are pretty rigid. And you can, you can put those in your filters, and they'll stand up. They'll stand and hold their shape. And uh, you cut them just right so they fit in your slots. And... Uh, or in some of your filters, right? It's just a square that just drops down. And then you just reuse them forever. So I don't like buying media over and over again, over and over again. I just don't like doing that. And I think it's like print cartridges. You know, they sell you the printer real cheap, but then they've got you hooked because they're the only ones that make the cartridges. And then you're, you're, you're going to be wasting a lot of money. So anyway, I've got about a half a dozen ideas on how to do a good job with our fish without spending a lot of money. I'll share those in an upcoming video. So let's do this. Let's take a look at any questions you might have. I'm checking the chat. If you have any questions, just go ahead and ask them now. John Wallace is using pinky floss in, yeah. Now the only, the only tip I would give you, John, on that is um, watch out for clogging. So just really watch watch the output of the filter, and if it really starts to get weak, uh, get in there and, and uh, swap it out, because the, the pinky does get clogged very quickly. Just a precaution. I used to put pinky, and I know it's not the best place for floss, but I used to put pinky at the, to at the top of the stack of that, the center stack of the FX6. I used to put the pinky there. That way I could just crack open the top just a little bit and reach in and slide it out and then slide another one in. And it was real easy to do because it would. It would get clogged up. If it's doing its job, it would get clogged up. So I didn't want it to be in the bottom tray uh, because then I'd have to pull the whole unit out. And that, as you know, that's a big production. So... Um, Emmons says frugal or sensible, and uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think it's a normal. I think it's a normal evolution for fish keepers in the very beginning to chase the style, to chase whatever's in style in fish keeping, whether it be uh, a certain kind of media or a certain kind of filtration, and you know they. They see a, someone plugging it. It looks good. They run out and buy it. I certainly did that. I did that. And I had very expensive media. And I don't regret it. I think it did a good job. But um, I really think we can accomplish a very comparable or similar outcome and leave a lot more money in our pockets because the, the – the hobby can get expensive, and and one way that would make the hobby. And keep in mind, one of my one of my stated goals or objectives is growth in the hobby. Is is people getting into the hobby, winning in the hobby, right? Enjoying the heck out of it, and staying in the hobby and expanding in the hobby. I love hearing from people who tell me, Ben, I got back in. I watched one of your videos. I jumped back into fish keeping. I, I got back into African cichlids. You know, I love hearing that kind of stuff because that is my stated purpose. So uh, money and cost can be an obstacle for doing that. So if you can, if you can shave off a few dollars uh, in, in some practical, some sensible decisions, why not, right? Why not do that? And instead... Spend the money on a fully colored up adult male cichlid. <laughs> Something like this guy here. Look at these two. Gorgeous. But you're going to pay probably between $30 and $60, depending where you go, for a fish like that. Look at this guy. Come on up here, guys. 
Beautiful colors. You can grow those out. You can save a lot of money. Buy three or four of each of them as a small one-inch fish. Roll the dice. That may be their male. Out of that, you'll get one good male, and, and it'll take you about three or four years, and you'll have maybe two years. Maybe two years. And you'll have some colorful males. Or you can you can you can pay bigger bucks and go to some place like the Cichlid Shack and get a nice, strong, robust, adult colored up males. And uh, and as I've gotten older, I've started to move in the direction of just buying colored up males. So I can just start enjoying them more from day one. And uh, that's just me. Certainly if I was in my 20s, I'd probably have, I don't know, four or five grow out tanks and and just buy my fish for, you know, half the price of one fish, I'd get I'd get five fish, and I'd grow them out, and then pick the pick of the litter, and then either sell or give away the other ones. So, all right, so let's see if you have any questions. If you have any questions, go ahead and ask them now. Uh, Michael H. comes in with a question again. I live in an area with uh, tap water, pH 7.4. And um, what are your thoughts on Malawi buffer? Am I wasting? Well, here's the deal. Um, what do your fish look like? Are they colorful? Are they interacting? Are they showing breeding uh, behavior? If they are, and they're healthy, right? They don't have caved-in bellies. I mean, and if they are... You know what? Uh, they've acclimated. They've acclimated. They're that they've, and they were probably, they were probably grown up in a tank that didn't have an eight point two, seven. You know, an eight point zero pH. So you're probably okay. I don't like chasing pH. I actually released a video, I don't know, a couple of years ago, entitled "Stop Chasing pH," because it was it was almost impossible to determine how much of these products to add and it, it could get real, real expensive real quick. So you've got, you have aragonite uh, as a substrate. So you're adding a nice steady flow of, of, of minerals. You have a, probably a very stable pH at seven, four, uh, maybe add a little limestone. I mean, but it's how do the fish look? If the fish look good, I wouldn't mess with it. Because, uh, you know, you, you'll shock them more by doing an abrupt pH change than, than you will having them live in a, at a pH level that they've acclimated to. That's my two cents. If you have another thought on that, folks, go ahead and share it. I'm giving you this is all one man's opinion here. Don't forget. <laughs> Everything I say, take with a grain of salt. All right, so let's see here. Yeah, David, David Glass, get some big, get bigger tanks for sure. Multi-tank syndrome. Get the 125, and the second you get the 125, start saving for the 210, and then start saving for the 300. <laughs> uh, Brian Barlow, I used to have cotton batting fine mesh as the last thing. The water ran. Now it's the first water runs through. Yeah, they uh, these are like water polishing materials. You can get what's called crib batting. You can buy it in any fabric store. Just be sure it is untreated. In other words, make sure it's not. Um, they 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 treat them sometimes so that they're not flammable uh, or flame uh, resistant or you know they have different treatments they do to it. Be sure it's just untreated white crib batting and. Uh, my problem when I used it is it would break up and then I'd have the little hairs, I'd have the little hairs infused in all the sponges. So I stopped using it. But while I was using it, I will admit that it polished the water, really, really polished the water. One of the ways to polish the water. You can also polish your water using something like pyrogen. If you, if you want to use a chemical, have that be the last thing the water touches before going to the tank. Something like secant pyrogen. And, of course, Pinky Floss. Pinky Floss does a good job. I love Pinky Floss. It stays together. You cut it to shape. You get a big roll for, for 10 bucks that lasts you a long time. So I think it's a good deal. 
You're welcome, Antonio. My pleasure, my friend. Sharpie models and aquatics. What are they doing? Are they breeding in there? Is that what's happening? You're, you're gonna get you're gonna get a lot of fry now <laughs> with fish that you're just using as a starter fish. <laughs> All right. Um, somebody's asking about the Santa. I haven't had an opportunity yet to use the Santa Monica algae scrubbers. I am going to use them at some point. I've just got to figure out a way to incorporate them either into the sump under this tank. I also have a uh, ESOP, uh, a trickle type sump that I got from a friend of mine here in Nashville, John. And uh, I might I might do that on the 90 or if I add 125 as the South Americans get bigger, I'm probably going to have a 125 gallon. I'll probably use an overflow box and, and that ESOP and I can attach the um, the Santa Monica uh, algae scrubber there. For those of you who don't know what an algae scrubber is, it's just a way of harnessing uh, the benefits of algae so that the algae grows in one place instead of all over your tank and um, adds oxygen to the tank, provides a treat for your fish, and reduces nitrates because the, the algae, which is being uh, harvested or grown on a perfect medium, and provided with the perfect light frequency so that it can grow. That will consume oxygen. I have one here. I'll, I'll show it to you what I mean. This is a mini version this is the small version of the small version of the Santa Monica filtration algae scrubber. And you have this rough surface area. That's where the algae will grow. And this goes inside the tank. And you have an airline that is running oxygen so that the algae is uh, being provided lots of oxygen, lots of, lots of uh, water movement. And then on the outside of the tank, you have these lights that are providing the perfect frequency needed for algae to go ahead and grow. So then this becomes covered, this becomes covered with algae. And then what every week you can you can clean it up and, and you can feed that algae to your fish as a treat and they love it. What I would do is I would open up the algae scrubber, I would open it up inside the tank and just let it sit on the bottom of the tank. I have some videos uh, about that. And the fish would just peck away at it. They would just peck away at it. My only hesitation on that is that this surface is rough. It is a rough surface so that the algae can really cling to it. And so uh, you could possibly create a little bit of, uh, you know, you, you might create a little, a, li a little bit of soreness in the lips of the fish if they eat a lot off of it. But comes with a very powerful magnet so that it hangs on. It's called a hog hang on glass algae scrubber and it just hangs on the tank. Just like that. I have uh, the bigger models and I have the small mini model. This would be a good size model to put into my sump and so I could have I could be harvesting algae out of the sump and reducing nitrates. Again, this tank runs at 10 parts per million so I'm not that concerned this will probably end up in um, probably in a sump on the 90 or a sump on, on a future tank, like a 125 for the South American, Central Americans when they get bigger. So, all right. Where are we? That was the two minute warning. <laughs> All right, folks, it looks like we're on the hour. I don't want to use your entire weekend, but I want to thank all of you for showing up today. And uh, thank you to my moderators. Thank you to all of you who super chatted. Your support is very, very appreciated. And uh, a big shout out and thank you to those who have jumped in and joined the uh, the Garage Gang. Uh, you, you are very appreciated. 
To know more about that, just simply hit the Patreon symbol, the Patreon symbol, which is uh, located underneath the banner of my channel, okay? So thank you, everybody, and uh, I hope to see you next week and look for some upcoming videos. I'm going to get that tank put into my wife's office, and uh, I'm going to do a video on being a frugal and provide and still provide quality, a uh, quality uh, life for your fish. All right. Okay. Have a great weekend, everyone. And hopefully, the next time I see you, I will be a grandfather. <laughs> All right. Bye, bye, everybody. You are the best. So long.